Live, yes. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to uh, each of you in the panel and uh, the friends who follow us uh, on stream as uh, we range, I think, uh, today uh, with people spanning across uh, Singapore to the Middle East, of course, which is our topic today, to Europe and to, I suspect, uh, the, uh, the West Coast uh, in America. Uh, we have a 45-minute session on the Middle East. The Middle East is, huge, is a huge subject on itself, and it, our session is named A Quest for Redevelopment. We all know that the Middle East has gone through tremendous transformations. There are turmoils, but there are also many plans. Uh, different countries in, in the Middle East have a well articulated plan for different horizons, 2025, 30 or later. Uh, so there is uh, indeed a, a redevelopment. Uh, and here we have uh, speakers who would, I think, maybe also want to emphasize on the quest which we have in this title, because Horasis being a, a conference of like-minded people, we all know that plans are fine. Execution of plans goes through uh, people and human people, training, resources, talents, and goodwill and connections across the world. So uh, with this note, I will not engage too much on what could be uh, the talks of different uh, contributors. I will just introduce everyone briefly and we'll start for the floor. Uh, we will have in uh, the order of session uh, Ahmed Al Sari, who is chairman of Malas Capital. Uh, Ahmed is uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia, is from Saudi Arabia and in Saudi Arabia today. Then we'll have Ahmed Demara, who is the founder and group chief executive officer of Reaya Holding, again in Saudi Arabia. Grant Harris, uh, who's uh, uh, waking up early, uh, thank you, from, uh, from the USA, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Connect Frontier USA, and he'll mention uh, more about that, I'm sure. Majid, Rafi, uh, Rafiza, uh, sorry, Majid Rafizadeh, uh, who's the President of the International American Council uh, in the USA. And Shirin Shaleh, who's the Managing Director of the Center for Engineering and Planning Palestine. Shirin, I see the program has put you, as we say, last but not least. Uh, it's a position uh, which has the privilege of ending, so you will have the concluding, the concluding words towards the end. And so far, we thank you for your patience. I'll be obedient to uh, Frank Richter, whom I'm saluting here. Hi, Frank. And I give the floor to Ahmed Al Sari, uh, Chairman Malas Capital from Saudi Arabia. Thank you, uh, Joel. Um, uh, I chair a, a finance company, an asset management company, but I come uh, with a long background in technology. I started as a programmer 50 years ago. Now, Dr. Richter has posed three questions to us. What does the future hold for this region? Will it achieve financial equilibrium? And how can it unite to inspire creativity? These are million dollar questions, for sure. And if this panel can answer them to any degree of satisfaction, then I think we all deserve a big reward. This region has all the elements for a successful future of sustainable growth. We have more people than the European Union at considerably lower age. We have natural resources, a reasonable level of literacy and education, a fair infrastructure, and fantastic destinations for tourism of several types. Above, above all, we have a, a young population that is technology savvy and capable of creativity and innovation. Achieving financial equilibrium will be a challenge, however, of varying intensity from country to country. Saudi Arabia addressed this question back in 2016, coinciding with the collapse of oil prices at the time. It adopted Vision 2030 along with a national transformation program and a fiscal balance program. Then came along COVID-19 this year, which 
definitely is posing a big challenge for all countries in the region. But there are those who have a roadmap to transformation and growth, and those who do not. And I think this will make the difference in the success of individual countries in reacting to uh, COVID and uh, development issues. Finally, the trillion dollar question. Can we unite across the region to inspire creativity? Policy coordination and economic integration across the region will be very difficult, in my opinion, in the medium term. However, it is possible to start coordination and gradual integration in smaller clusters among countries that view that they have uh, a common destiny and appreciate dialogue and mutual accommodation. How much success can we achieve? Stability definitely is the key. And I don't really have the answer. So I, I waive my reward and, and I hope that my fellow panelists will come up with some good answers. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed, for uh, putting those questions. I'm sure roadmaps is an issue. Adjustment to roadmaps is also, uh, you know, adjusting the roadmap, sorry, to the COVID-19 will be something that will come back to this conversation. Uh, I'll get back to you on that uh, after the first round of, uh, uh, of our panelists give their talking <coughs> point. Ahmed Emara, you have the floor. Uh, uh, you're the founder and group chief executive officer, as I said, of Rayaya Holding. You might want to introduce what is Rayaya Holding and give your first round of uh, opinions on the <laughs> we got from uh, Frank. But it's good that Frank gave us those trillion dollar questions because Saudi Arabia chairs the G20 this year. And there was this meeting early on on the uh, COVID-19, where uh, the G20 vouched for $5,000 billion. So, uh, well, this is the magnitude of problems we're talking exactly. So thank you again for inviting me to this uh, uh, very, very good uh, conference. I, I think it's my first time to uh, participate in races, and it's been seriously improving year and year. Uh, my name is Ahmed Amara. I'm uh, a surgeon by profession, but I've crossed to the dark side of uh, investments many, many years ago. So I did an MBA, and since then I've been uh, saving more money than lives, which I should have done uh, uh, as a physician. Uh, now, uh, to answer these uh, trillion dollars questions, again, <laughs> as Ahmed said, I don't have the answer, and I don't... Uh, I don't think any uh, any would have. I, I would love to, but I don't think so. Uh, my approach to the uh, to this is simply Middle East is a huge geography, and I always tell my Western friends, uh, let's not go into this mistake of looking at Middle East as a one block. Middle East is uh, extremely valuable region, extremely diversified. Yes, there are lots of commonalities. Uh, among different regions, among different sub-regions in the Middle East, but it's very, very uh, uh, different when it comes to uh, level of income, uh, financial development, infrastructure, and so forth. So uh, uh, my uh, humbled answer to the first question about the future of the Middle East, I think the Middle East, I believe that the Middle East will have a very good future going forward simply because we have all the factors uh, for success. Uh, but the speed of achieving uh, such a uh, bright future will differ from one region to the other. We all know that the GCC is much more coherent than the other regions uh, or the other sub-regions across the Middle East. And even within the GCC, some countries are moving faster than the others. The other question or the other point uh, about financial equilibrium, again, uh, some regions across uh, the Middle East uh, still need basic human rights. Uh, people are still struggling uh, to reach to clean water and uh, decent uh, level of education, while other uh, regions have achieved a lot and advanced a lot. I'm talking today from Dubai, 
because our business is scattered across the GCC. Uh, and uh, UAE is preparing to launch uh, its first mission uh, to the space, uh, which is a, a huge advancement uh, in comparison to, again, uh, people in the south of Egypt not having uh, enough clean water and not having uh, a, a level of uh, a decent level of education, uh, even at the primary level. So one more time, I emphasize how I look to the Middle East. The Middle East is very different. Uh, it will move uh, in a different speed. Uh, financial equilibrium will be achieved in some of the regions, but much faster than the uh, other regions. Now, how can we foster uh, innovation? Uh, it's simply uh, we should take care of our young people. As Ahmed said, Middle East is one of the youngest, contains one of the youngest population across this globe. So uh, more education, more education, and more education. This is how I see the future in the Middle East. Thank you, Ahmed, and uh, thank you for conveying this uh, sense of diversity. Diversity is something obvious when we think about the Middle East, but usually in sense of confessional, confessional diversity, in the sense of um, people's diversity, not so much in terms of development diversity, you are right, and not so much in the magnitude which you have mentioned uh, from conquering the space uh, down to uh, the, the basic human daily life uh, problems and matters like, like, like clean water. Uh, I'll get back to that uh, on the second round on trying to see how there could be intra-Middle East cooperations as well, because I speak from a region, Europe, which has diversity, but maybe on a lesser span, of course. We see regional constructions in different parts of the world. Uh, that's one key for future uh, in a, you know, current state of affairs where multilateralism is, is, is under attack or has deficiencies. Uh, I'm sure in that matter, the experience, the experience of the Middle East uh, can be important for uh, other uh, regions. So uh, uh, I'll, I'll get back to you, uh, I'll get back to you uh, on, on, on that, uh, on the second round uh, of question. Uh, our next speaker, Grant Harris, uh, is now the Chief Executive Officer of Connect Frontier USA. Uh, we were talking of the next frontier of the space. Uh, Grant, you'll explain to us what is Connect Frontier. Uh, you've had a long career already, very full of uh, frontiers before. Uh, I'm sure this will come later in the conversation, but uh, Grant, you have the floor. Thank you. And thank you to my fellow panelists and Joel, and thank you also to Dr. Richter for inviting me. But Connect Frontier, as, as Joel was alluding to, is a consultancy that advises companies and universities and nonprofits that are working in emerging and frontier markets. And prior to that, I've worked twice in the White House in the United States and in the U.S. State Department and been a corporate lawyer as well. And so I've worked in various capacities thinking about some of these leadership challenges and the development and policy challenges I've already appreciated the comments of my panelists thinking about youth and education. And similarly, I wanted to just make three quick points in trying to open and broaden the conversation. First is that from my perspective, I think this is a really pivotal moment for the region. And as the description teed up and with which I agree, I don't think that oil is the future. And I think that the key questions have to go with which countries will really show leadership in shifting to service-based industries and growing the digital economy. And progress has been so mixed in these regards. As the previous speaker noted, it's an incredibly diverse region. And as both fellow panelists noted, it's a young region as well. And I, I wanted to just throw out a couple of statistics to try to put that into a frame that according to UNICEF, half of the population is under 24 years old. And if we think about that, that between 2018 and 2040, that's when the dependency ratio, which is the proportion of non-working age people to working age people 
is predicted to be lowest. And that means that as the population is doubling in size right now and it's young, and you've got this favorable ratio that it is a huge opportunity for growth. Or in some countries that could be destabilizing if we don't have enough jobs and opportunities. <clears throat> My second point then is that each leader needs to ask him or herself, what are we doing to provide opportunities and create growth? It's not a secret recipe, but it is a difficult recipe to create such growth and to turn this into a demographic dividend. It requires investing in education, as was mentioned. It requires creating an entrepreneurial ecosystem. And each of these countries are gonna to need to compete for capital on, on the international stage. And the Atlantic Council, which is the think tank here in the United States, recently gathered a collection of CEOs of, of companies that have major investment interests in the Middle East. And the way that they concluded is they said they really wanted to see a fundamental shift among international investors to see the region as a market to deploy capital rather than simply a place to extract it. And that's a fundamental shift, I think, to think about, and it means strong investment climates. And my third and, and final point is then this raises the question as well, in creating growth, is this growth going to be inclusive and sustainable? It, unless women and refugees and marginalized populations are included, then the answer would be no. And it's all about investing in human capital, in my opinion, as well. Certainly there are serious development challenges in the Middle East, like every region, uh, including that Adolescents and, and children face difficulty in getting education, and UNICEF has noted as well that there are high incidences of, of violence in school and in the classroom and, and elsewhere. And, and these are, are serious challenges for making youth feel safe and have those opportunities. In some, though, I think it will all come down to leadership on a country-by-country -country basis, on a market-by-market -market basis, and there is huge opportunity uh, and whether the leadership exists there will be, I think, the primary question. Thank you. Thank you, Grant, for those uh, four key points. Uh, you rose early, uh, given where you live, uh, but your mind is as fresh as uh, our other speakers. Uh, I'll get back to your uh, issues on uh, entrepreneurism and on uh, competing. <laughs> In the whole world is competing for capital, but it also seems there's a lot of capital in finance and money these days, uh, as we've created a lot. So we're also competing for uh, opportunities and for projects. Uh, uh, the next speaker is on the list is uh, Majid Rafizadeh, but I don't see Majid, so I'm not sure. Uh, no, I'm sure we will be doing without Majid this day, today. And uh, so I give the floor to Shirin, Shirin Chale. Shirin, you're the managing director of the Center for Engineering and Planning Palestine. If you would please just remind us the status of uh, this uh, center. Is it a public undertaking? Is it a company? Is it a not-for-profit? Uh, you, you've seen that we have questions, solutions, and uh, also consultancy proposals, uh, as Grant said, for the different categories. Please tell us more about uh, the center, and you have the floor. Okay. Tell us if uh, you're, are you speaking from Palestine today? Yes, yeah, I'm in Ramallah. I am from my office, so now speaking from my office in Ramallah. Okay. Uh, hi, all. Uh, my name is Shirin Chile. I am a civil engineer. I'm partner and managing director for Center for Engineering and Planning. It's a private company, so it's a private-owned company. Uh, I am the main shareholder. Uh, it's an old company. was established in 1980. It's actually, if it is not the biggest, one of the biggest consultancy companies in Palestine. was established that uh, that uh, in, in, in the last period, in 1980. I, I joined the company since, like, it's, it's it's about 14 years uh, where I joined the uh, I was joined I joined the con the company uh, as uh, a regular employee. Then I start having shares in the company, and now I own almost the whole company. So uh, the company itself has branches in Iraq, um, 
uh, lately we were in Libya, but we left after the uh, last uh, situation. And we have also a branch in UAE. Uh, the company itself is working mainly on infrastructure um, and physical planning, airman planning. We do a lot of infrastructure projects design like uh, uh, sewer uh, development of new cities, uh, master planning of big communities and small ones. So it's more uh, engineering consultancy uh, services that we provide here in Palestine and in the region. So back to the subject. I am maybe I'm a bit a, a little less optimistic than the rest of the uh, of the other panelists because I am maybe I'm from the part of the region who is living under a more uh, stress uh, situation politically, economically, and socially. So uh, for me, I can say that um, um, with the current uh, political condition, uh, which reflects in a way or in another on the other social and economic ones. The redevelopment of the Middle East, in my opinion, is very challenging. Uh, first, to summarize quickly what the others already mentioned, uh, population growth in the Middle East is the highest in the world, with almost 3.7%. Uh, half of the population in the Middle East is in age less than 24 years old, uh, which, which also uh, uh, led to unemployment rate uh, which is a very high unemployment rate. In Palestine, for example, it's one of the highest unemployment rate in the world. Uh, in the West Bank, it's almost 27%. And in Gaza, it's almost 50% of unemployment rate. So uh, you can imagine how would we, the development or uh, the even the, let's say, work on the enhancing the people uh, quality of life is something very challenging in Palestine and it's not only in Palestine because of the current political condition it's in the whole region that is close to Palestine it's the same in Jordan Iraq Syria all these countries uh, which either under a uh, very difficult economical situation or under uh, let's say wars or civil wars um, just to give to give quick points, uh, back to the current political problems, Syria, Iraq, Libya, and Yemen, all these countries uh, who are suffering more, most these days, uh, we can say that for the refugee, we are exporting many migrants to the other regions that are among people who are under uh, life threats or under very bad economical situation, uh, we, we, which also uh, means that... Um, in the same region, we have a very a very high destruction of the economy. A lot of the countries in the Middle East were stable to some extent in the, in the last period. However, uh, it has more and more uh, situation due to civil wars, wars, any external factors, bad government performance. So many factors that we are in the Middle East in, in the part of my, my region are suffering from. Uh, for the infrastructure itself, uh, either in Palestine or in the region, it's either in a very bad condition or it's already destroyed, which is a very, let's say, a prerequisite for any development. Uh, the other points I want to talk about, it's about the absence of, uh, let's say, decisive political bodies, which is in most cases led to corrupted system, misleading ones in a way to the countries went to fullness, which means loss many of the people Local people uh, lost the confidence in their system, which also uh, add a lot to even their, uh, let's say, commitment to the country, their loyalty to the country, or even using their investment in the country. And this add also to the international people who would even do that for, for example, in Palestine, uh, we're, we're, we're like we are so, um, spirit of having more and more of the diaspora investing in Palestine in order to help on enhancing and upgrading the current conditions. However, with the recent development, more uh, far to some extent, they are pushed away from the from investing in Palestine. Uh, for the education system, I repeat, yeah, it, 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 in in many of our uh, in the Middle East is very challenging. Uh, they are mostly either weak or very traditional. Uh, again, for the in addition to that, we um, will be adding a very important point regarding the ecosystem. Uh, when I talk, maybe I talk more about uh, Palestine and the countries surrounding it. It's, it's, uh, it's very weak. 
uh, we can say that in general, we don't have really an ecosystem. We have several institutions, uh, let's say governmental bodies, but in, they are not coherent, not integrated in a way to create a full ecosystem that would help and attract people to uh, either in, uh, invest or even think of the country as a place where they can uh, develop uh, or put money or, or, or even have some security for uh, the, the future. Uh, I, I'll, I'll quickly uh, give some very, very, uh, uh, very short, um, let's say, quick thoughts on the way forward. For me, uh, very important, serious political. Do uh, you want me to do this in the second round, or yes, yes, okay? Yes, uh, because you have given us, and I thank you for the points, uh, the analytical points which you gave. You said you would be more pessimistic. Uh, I don't know, but you've, you've identified a series of issues to be tackled. Of course, maybe in a different magnitude from one country to another, we've understood the positionality from which you, you speak, yeah. but, but they are nonetheless uh, valuable and important. And, and they, again, they're relevant for many uh, parts of the world. What, what I like in the diagnostic, and we move to, to solutions later, uh, or to leads, and, and I'm happy they are leads, so you're not fully pessimistic. Uh, but at, at this stage, I would want just to, to, to notice that, um, what you said echoes to what Grant said about jobs, about the need to, uh, to look for, for, for talents. That's also what uh, something that Ahmed said in his first, uh, in the, in the first, uh, presentation and, and um, again you re-emphasize what was said on, on the issue of so that sometimes in some parts of the Middle East some basic needs are, are, are important. I think we have with your interventions a kind of array of diversity and of I would say different uh, issues to, to be tackled. Now if I would want to if I would return to Ahmad you Ahmad you had mentioned in your talk um, the roadmaps and coordination. And what was interesting to me in the roadmaps was to understand how different countries having different roadmaps still face that those roadmaps are hit by the COVID. That would be one uh, point on which you might have a few bullet points uh, answers. And the second question, you mentioned clusters of coordination. Uh, what would be the clusters? Are you talking sectoral cluster, geographical cluster, sub-regional clusters? We have uh, slightly less than 20 minutes. So if you would take like, so four minutes and, you know, few bullet points, couple of bullet points, three bullet points, that, that would help us tremendously. Yes, and, and I think the, the, the key question that we have to answer among ourselves as regional players is uh, where the areas of complementarities are. Mm. Uh, if we can identify that, those, then uh, our cluster could actually be overlapping. Uh, um, we already have one cluster here as the GCC. And as Ahmed mentioned, uh, I think we've, exp although it's 40 years old and uh, the degree of success has, has not been as originally uh, envisioned, but it is uh, a working uh, a working coalition with, with, with its own problems. Uh, I'll give you an example of what's happening in Saudi Arabia. Uh, we have an area in the northwest of Saudi Arabia that is now called Neom. It's uh, 28,000 square kilometers. It offers a great deal. It's been declared to be an area of development of future technologies and to be completely 100% green. Uh, and if you notice, it will be bordering Jordan and bordering uh, Egypt across uh, the Gulf of Aqaba. And the view is to have uh, 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 Jordan, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia um, uh, extend hands across the borders to, uh, to develop future technologies. And uh, I think one thing as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, an area, we need to look at where the uh, comparative advantages of each country is and see where uh, there are meeting points. Uh, hmm. And I think that, that exists. I'll give you an example in, 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 
since uh, the, 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 the reduction in oil prices and since COVID, a lot of people have left Saudi Arabia. Um, I noticed that some of them, like accountants, for example, are still serving their old uh, companies using technology. So uh, uh, now we have, you know, uh, people who were here, now back in Egypt, for example, and continuing to do their job. These are things that we can look for to see how yeah. we can actually integrate uh, uh, to, to some degree. Um, Thank you very much, Ahmed, for that. You know, I'm an economist, so I should love uh, what you said about comparative advantages, but I love even more the two examples you gave, because we stand at a period of time where it's more also at the sub-regional level, at the provincial level, at the cross-border level, and I love your first example. I've traveled that region by land, by boats. It's very important that across the border, there's no such a discrepancy. And we live in an age and time when we've had, when different parts of the world have seen Many pilot projects, it's, high, it's high, high, high time, sorry, for scaling up. And the two examples you gave are, uh, offer good ground for, for scaling. I'm sure we could, so I thank you for, for those points. I'm sure we could have a full session on, on this and maybe we, my think tank, we are happy to, I'm not introduced myself, by the way. I chair a think tank called The Bridge. Uh, we are part of the G20. I'll stop there. No advertisements. Uh, but. We, these are subjects we could uh, develop uh, for hours. Uh, in the intro, so thank you for bringing those examples. I believe in examples. Uh, uh, Ahmed uh, Emara, you had mentioned about the diversities uh, as well. I would want to ask you one question, which is en not energy, but energies in plural, because you are based in the Emirates, uh, uh, you are in Dubai, Abu Dhabi uh, has been exemplary in setting a course for green energies, renewable energies. Uh, Saudi Arabia has made some interesting and un you know, unforeseen moves uh, on you know, on oil, on carbon pricing, those kind of issues uh, over the G20 presidency. Is this not the diversity of energies that we have to today, the difference, uh, the, the magnitude of the, or the scale of different systems which we can have, which fit different differently on different stages of development, is it not something, according to you, which could be a sector, which could be an area of cooperation in the line of, of, of the clusters uh, that uh, that Ahmed was mentioning? He finished his, his, his <laughs> second with oil, but they are all the renewable energies. Mm -hmm. So, Mara, in from the Emirates, what, what what is your what is your opinion on that? <laughs> Definitely, hundred percent. I mean, I'm not an expert. Obviously, I'm more into healthcare, uh, so I have uh, very very little knowledge about the energy sector. But as you have rightly said, I think this region uh, is and will remain for the foreseeable future a very important source of different kind of energies to the whole world. Uh, and what you have mentioned is uh, really an eye-opener when you think about it, that uh, this subject, which is uh, the engine uh, for the whole growth globally, uh, could be a really uh, a point of collaboration, discussion, and uh, integration between the different countries across mm. the region. Mm. Uh, technology is there. Uh, some of the countries uh, in the region are extremely advanced when it comes to uh, uh, energy-related technologies. Sources are there. Uh, clean energy is there. Uh, the uh, oil and gas is there. So uh, to answer your question shortly, of course, I think it's a great, great subject for integration uh, across the region. And, and, and I want to be fair to your specialty, the health sector, of course, uh, maybe in a bullet point, the connection you see between uh, secured energy and the health sector in the region? So what we have noticed, uh, I think the whole world noticed in the last uh, uh, few months uh, since the beginning of this COVID, is that uh, you cannot really go anywhere without a, a solid uh, healthcare sector. I have always been biased to healthcare and I've always been uh, promoting healthcare uh, versus different sectors 
uh, as a defensive sector for investments. But I think uh, everyone now uh, acknowledges the importance of healthcare uh, across the region. And this is across the globe even. And this is one of the sectors similar to energy that where we could have an enormous amount of collaboration and integration. Yeah. The COVID, I think, forced all nations today to talk to each other in order to uh, uh, manage the crisis of COVID globally. Uh, we've been uh, uh, among the lucky players uh, across uh, the region. Mm -hmm. We have achieved uh, double-digit growth, uh, very, very decent growth uh, over last year performance. Uh, and we are now preparing for further growth in 2021 uh, and, uh, uh, and going forward because every single government in the region and across the globe again are investing and earmarking more investments for healthcare in the coming near future. And that's something we well, thank you, Ahmed. It's that's really something we need to follow on uh, from the Middle East, but also from other parts of the world, because I, I really agree with you that it's connected. You said you have a bias for health. I would say it's a good bias. And uh, we encourage you to save more lives than money uh, in the future, <laughs> to quote to quote you. Uh, we're running not short of time, but uh, time time is passing. I, I, I'm back to, I'm back to uh, Grant. Um, two points, Grant. Uh, you mentioned you were President Obama's senior advisor on Africa. I, I was happy to be in 2014 in the uh, guest uh, to the U.S. Africa Forum, as you can obviously see. I'm an African. Uh, what has been what has been the follow up? Where where, where do we stand? Especially, uh, there was at the time I remember a Young African Leaders Initiative was launched. What's the controls? What's the progress? What's what's the need ahead? We, we're talking Middle East today, but we all know that Middle East, many countries in the Middle East have some bilateral cooperation to Africa. What what can we do together? What can they do in that? And the second point, maybe more briefly, uh, you mentioned that Middle Eastern countries need to compete for capital. All countries need to compete for capital, and it's been the case since long. What's new? <laughs> Those are two very big questions. We're wrestling. And, and I'm sorry, you know, I, and, and it's unfair, but in, in, in little That's time. Okay. So let me do my best. And I think in the spirit of the discussion today as well, I'll try to take some of the lessons learned from the Young African Leaders Initiative mm -hmm. and think about how that may or may not be helpful as we've all been talking about the demographics in the Middle East. When I was in the White House, we launched an initiative called the Young African Leaders Initiative, which was meant to support a young and fast-growing population across Africa, where the median age is 19 years old, and where over 70% of the population is under the age of 35. So it's also a very young and fast-growing population. And one of the heavy points of emphasis were on was on entrepreneurship. And that's also something that fellow panelists have been mentioning today, too, and creating this, this ecosystem for growth. And I think <clears throat> this is especially important for Middle Eastern leaders to be thinking about as in trying to create innovation in the service economy that I mentioned. The ecosystem, in some ways, has been strengthening. I know that McKinsey and others have reported increases in, in venture capital and total funding in the region. And it's relatively speaking increased, but in absolute terms, it's not a lot of money compared to what the need is. Yeah. And some, we've also been talking about a theme of mixed progress and about how some countries are, are progressing more than others. And when we think about fintech or when we think about creating room for entrepreneurship, some countries that have been leading as well, like the fintech factory set up in Egypt, or in the United Arab Emirates, the FinTech Hive, or in Kuwait, there's, they've set up a, a national fund for small and medium enterprise development. Or Bahrain has initiated a regulatory sandbox. Again, though, these initiatives, though, we should welcome them. They are not matching the need overall, and much more needs to be done. And, and so we need to get more capital there. And we need to also focus on the basics, as other speakers have said, too, in education and safety and opportunities for youth. A lot of this goes back to national development strategies that 
are inclusive, that focus on these incentives and education and skills creation and job creation incentives and a solid regulatory framework as well, which is a, a pretty good segue to try to tackle your second question, which is what do I mean by competing for capital? And what I mean by that is that, as everyone knows, capital is cowardly and it seeks stability. It seeks the having returns that are as safe as possible. And as part of that stability, it really looks for solid economic governance and it looks for consistency in policy. And there are a lot of steps that Middle Eastern leaders can take to improve the business climate and investment climate within their respective countries. And here again, progress is, is very mixed. There have been some looking to make strong uh, reforms. One of the rubrics that is often referred to is the World Bank Ease of Doing Business Index. And if you look at the 2020 report, Saudi Arabia and Jordan and, and Bahrain and Kuwait were some of the 10 most improved nations based on their reforms. Uh, but there's a lot more to do in simplifying investment laws and in liberalizing capital and trade and labor markets and in taking steps to really compete for that capital and increase investor interest. Thank you, Grant. Uh, that's really appreciated. And again, a lot of uh, work ahead, but uh, they are willing people to do it. To do it. Shirin, I see we have slightly less than four minutes. I hope we're not getting disconnected, but I would not want that we do. So in nearly four minutes, uh, you said you have ideas for solutions. We want to hear that. Actually, it's just ideas. The, the solution is it will take will be taking to, long time. So uh, these are tough points. The first one is the most challenging one, which is a, a serious political and institutional reforms. I'm talking again mm -hmm. on the on the region that uh, in Palestine and the surrounding ones, uh, which we all know is the biggest challenge that we have. However, without building trusted and transparent system, strong governments, re re reliable institutions. Uh, we would not attract uh, any investors or even um, make people uh, trust their uh, system, uh, uh, trust their system in, in real situation. Uh, so uh, we want clear and easy ecosystem. Uh, we also uh, need to diversify the economy. Uh, we should uh, we should uh, become more dependent on ourselves than depending on others. And making uh, less ex yani to, to export less and import more. Uh, we do this by having more, uh, let's say, direction to uh, encourage people to, let's say, go to the industrial sectors and the trade ones. We're more on the services level, uh, people. Um, I'm talking about again, in Palestine. So we should think more about how we can be more dependent. We know that we receive funds and donations from several international communities and Arab countries. We should use it in much more efficient way. Uh, let's say focusing more in the local economic development, more than just providing urgent needs. We are in, in, in let's say, in very uh, strong need of urgent uh, responses. However, we should think more on the long term than just responding on urgent needs. Uh, the other thing is to invest on the youth. Uh, we have so many, uh, let's say, very good and uh, and intelligent people. What we have to, but we need to invest in them more by providing them more opportunities, creating for them more uh, space to innovate and create, uh, and engage them in the decision maker making. This is very important. Uh, education is another thing. The other thing is to work more on our infrastructure, how we can enhance it in a way to be uh, a good base for any development. Thank you. Thank you so much for this long list, but uh, useful list. At the beginning uh, uh, of our talk, Ahmad al Sari said some countries have a roadmap, some other countries don't have. I can see, Shirin, that you have a roadmap. Me, but my, my, my government, no, so I'm that's, trying to that's, push. That's why, that's why <laughs> there are these exist, to share ideas yeah. and roadmap. We have few seconds i would ask you i would uh, not take my uh, chair last word or whatever i would ask each of you one word one word as a takeaway either a word of wisdom hope or a tip for business i don't know it's also a business community horizons ahmed al-sari one word about the middle east 
We have to work together around the world, uh, around the region. Thanks, Ahmed Emara. Cooperation. Cooperation. That's one. Ahmed Emara. One word. Education. Education. Grant Harris from the U.S. It's all about leadership. Leadership. And Shirin, you have the last final word. It's also leadership and security. Lovely, amazing. It's an amazing panel. I wish we have double more time. <laughs> or more. Thank you. I don't know, guys. I, I try to do my best uh, with this post-COVID-19. Uh, I hope I didn't fail too much. I, I really appreciate it. I enjoyed uh, the beginning of the conversation. Uh, we're all linked through emails uh, which uh, stand uh, even after our session stops. Uh, Let's see if something happens on that. I will try and have uh, to my team to write not a conclusion, not a, but some notes and uh, send that to each of you. And uh, yeah, let me just uh, share again that I really appreciate it and enjoyed the session. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, you. Bye. Bye Thank you. Bye all. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. I will, I will do good other sessions. The the Horasis conference continues. The, the program is exciting. So I leave you with the program. We can always recap with the virtual uh, chat uh, after the program is over. Thanks to all of you. Bye. Bye. Bye.